of the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation. Um, he is responsible, among other things, in helping to stand up a new model for School of Education in partnership with MIT, a very central part of which is a competency-based education view of what it means to develop the next generation of teachers as well as the next generation of school leaders. So with that background, has ample, uh, ample perspective to help frame where credentialing sits today, but really in the long arc in the historical evolution of post-secondary education. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Arthur Levine. Thank you, Dr. Good afternoon, everybody. You'd be surprised how often I'm compared to Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real honor to be with you for a variety of reasons. I think the topic we've been discussing all day is vital to the future of higher education. And I'm also a huge fan of Michael Jenkins. Now, I recognize that all that stands between you and the bar as me and Matt. About that, there's good news and bad news. The good news is I don't intend to use all the time that's been given to me for this talk. The bad news is that won't be optics. Is that better? Yes. Okay, thank you. Actually, now we're going to hear the this story. Let you know what you're getting into. When I was still a teacher's college, my last year, I used to teach a course periodically, and I got my course evaluations back. And I had one course evaluation that said if I had 20 minutes left to live, I would want to spend them in Arthur Levine's class. <laughs> because every minute with Arthur Levine feels like an hour. <laughs> So I'm going to talk to you for about a day and a half. <laughs> now what I want to do is put what we've been talking about all day into historical perspective. Now is that interesting or what? While important and forward looking Nothing we discuss today is unusual, radical, or unprecedented in the history of higher education. Innovation and credentialing is a normal, periodic, even predictable event. Higher education follows changes in the nation. The more profound the changes in the nation, the more dramatic the changes in higher education that occur in its wake. Now, all of our social institutions lag behind those changes in society, whether it's government, or media, or healthcare, or finance. What happens is not-for-profits tend to change by repair or reform of the existing organizations and are slower to move than for-profits that change by replacement. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to take you back two centuries to illustrate what I'm talking about. I'm going to take you back to the Industrial Revolution. It's a time which America is making a transition from a local agrarian economy to a national industrial economy. As this starts in the first decades of the 19th century, America's colleges, which haven't changed a heck of a lot since the first one opens its doors in 1636, they are offering an education designed for a sectarian agricultural society. The curriculum 
It's rooted in the trivium quadrivium of the Middle Ages. Students studied Bible, including two Corinthians. <laughs> the languages of Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. Rhetoric, grammar, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, history, and the nature of plants. There were no courses. Students studied one subject a day from 8 a.m. in the morning to 5 p.m. at night, Monday through Friday, and a half day Saturday. Friday was not a party night. <laughs> For that matter, neither was Saturday. The methods of instruction were recitation, and there what you did was repeat orally, verbatim, lessons that had been signed, and disputation, which are formulaic debates using Aristotelian syllogisms on themes such as, we sin while we sleep. <laughs> Boy, I had to tell you, I had a dream last <laughs> Then came the Industrial Revolution. And in the decades before the Civil War, we saw the rise of canals, steamboats, water-powered factories. First factory opens in 1790. By 1860, there are 140,000. Railroads, mechanized farms, and the telegraph. And with these changes in transportation and communication, and production causes this mass migration of the population. People move from farms to cities. People move from the east to the west. People come from abroad. And what they do is they knit this country of regions or localities into regions and from regions into a fledgling nation. Now, for the most part, while this is going on, dramatic change. Rip Van Winkle is said to be a story that was intended as a metaphor for the era. You go to bed one night, when you wake up the next day, it's as if 20 years have passed. That's how fast changes occur. So most colleges, in the face of this dramatic change, hold tight to their, class, their classical curriculums and reject calls for reform. In fact, after years, years of criticizing Yale for the irrelevance of its curriculum, the state of Connecticut cut off funding. Yale responded as colleges do when they're in trouble. They formed a committee. <laughs> in 1828, Yale issued a report which surprisingly has come to be called the Yale Report of 1828. <laughs> it defended the classical curriculum for providing students with discipline and furniture of the mind. That is, how to think and what to think about. It dismissed vocationalism, abbreviated courses of, of study, and practical education as lesser forms of education, mere training. Gee, how things have changed. Nonetheless, there were, there were experiments in reform. Some succeeded, most failed. Union College took the radical step of offering a program rooted in science, engineering, and modern language. For this, they're rewarded with enrollments twice the size of Harvard and Yale. What happened was enrollments declined. The president of Brown looked into the situation and lamented, we can't even give this stuff away. <laughs> In the years after the Civil War, the pace and scope of the Industrial Revolution accelerated. And this time it was driven by oil and steel and booming railroads and cities, the invention of electric lights, the telephone, and all the other things that are familiar to us today. America became an industrial giant. 
and higher education changed dramatically, powered to a great extent by new institutions. Instead of those colonial colleges, radical things were created. One of them was universities. Johns Hopkins brought the first graduate school to America. Cornell promised any person, any study. Chicago stole all of these ideas and created its own university. And what these places offered was advanced studies, professional education, industrial era fields like engineering and business. They engaged in research on real problems. And they organized universities as we organize businesses by specialization. We also developed some schools that focused on industrial technologies like MIT. We created land grant colleges. And their job was to straddle both periods, somewhere between agriculture and technology, industrial issues. And we created two-year colleges so we could offer higher education more locally. And the curriculum changed to reflect both. It changed to reflect the times, and it changed to reflect the new institutions. This new era brought courses, specialized majors, advanced studies beyond the baccalaureate, academic departments, and electives. In 1869, there was one elective course at Harvard. In 1909, there were two required courses at Harvard. Things changed fast. Now think about the implications of these innovations for just a second. If you're going to offer courses, what this requires is breaking the curriculum into smaller units than the Colonial College had. If you can offer majors, what that requires is specialized studies, hierarchies among courses, and variation between students in terms of what they're studying. And if you can offer electives, that makes it even worse. You're offering students choice and individualizing course selection for every one of them. So this required some changes some major changes that gets to the heart of our discussion today. It necessitated new degrees. They created an associate's degree. They created a raft of baccalaureate degrees, including the Bachelor of Science. They created the first earned uh, graduate degrees, which became a slew of master's degrees, a slew of doctoral degrees. There was also a need to change assessment. <laughs> Where'd you all go? <laughs> Is this a surprise party for me? <laughs> so what you need is a new system of assessment, too. You need mechanisms for assessment that are tied to courses, which didn't exist before. So in 1878, Harvard introduces this radical new grading system, A through E. E became F. For each course. And it set a fixed number of courses for graduation. Lots of grading systems were tried. Colleges all over the country tried different grading systems. And finally, the accrediting association said, look, we need to agree on one system. What also happened is, if you're down to course units, there's got to be some system of academic accounting. How do you know what a course is? How do you measure a course? The credit system was introduced in the 1870s. After experimentation, college is trying a whole bunch of different schemas for courses and credits. Any number of initiatives aimed at standardization followed. 
And in 1906, the Carnegie Foundation created the new norm, the Carnegie Unit, a time and course-based accounting system which defines a unit as 15 recitations per week in a single subject for a year. 14 high school units are to be required for college admissions. Seat time became the currency of academia. <coughs> Using the new degrees, the new assessments, the new accounting systems, a new model of education was established. And it was based in one of the dominant and most successful technologies of the industrial era. I'm serious, the assembly line. Education would entail 12 years of schooling, 180 days a year, four to five major courses for periods of time prescribed by the Carnegie Foundation. College graduation would be tied to the accumulation of required numbers of courses or credits. The modern industrial era system of higher education was established. That's what we've been talking about all day. So let's jump to the present. Once again, the United States is undergoing an economic transformation, second in our history. This time, the shift is from a national, analog, industrial economy to a global digital information economy. The difference between the two is this. Industrial economies focus on common processes. Time and process are fixed. Outcomes are variable. In contrast, information economies focus on outcomes. Process and time are variables. So in terms of education, what that means is the industrial system focuses on teaching, seat time. And the information economy system focuses on learning. Time's a variable, mastery is the key. That's a revolutionary change of all the reforms going on in education right now. And there are a gazillion. None is larger than that or has greater implications. What it means is that the current degrees, assessments, and accounting systems don't work anymore. Despite their inordinate, inordinate, I can do this. <laughs> I've said this word before in my life. Despite their inordinate, despite their extraordinary success, <laughs> For more than a century, they become obsolete. In a 2015 report, the Carnegie Foundation put it this way. What they said was the Carnegie unit sought to standardize student exposure to subject matter by ensuring they received consistent amounts of instructional time. It was never, never, I added the second never, that's not part of the point. <laughs> ever intended to function as a measure of what students learned. And that puts us in exactly the same place as our industrial era predecessors. We're inventing a new model. We're inventing a new model of credentialing, certifications, degrees, something else, badges micro-credentials, a new assessment system, and we need a new accounting system. Now, I really believe these things are going to occur. I believe in them so strongly that, as Matt said, Woodrow Wilson is in the process of M with MIT of creating a new graduate school of education, which will be competency-based, which will be time-variable, which will award micro-credentials in addition to degrees. Now, we can expect the process we're going to go through to resemble the process we've been through in the past. It's not going to be real different. 
What we're going to see first is continued embrace of the current model by most colleges and universities and rejection need to reform. Why should they? This has worked in the past. Why shouldn't it continue to work into the future? Why? Remember, the future happens behind your back, not in front of your face. They were busy working, and the world changed. They didn't see it. What we'll see is experimentation, first small, then increasingly widespread, both inside and outside of higher education. We'll see the establishment of new models. We've talked about a whole bunch of them today. And their institutions like Western Governors, Southern New Hampshire, Alverno. And those institutions are going to grow stronger and stronger through successful approximations or be replaced by institutions which have taken what they've done to the next step. Elite institutions would keep coming up in the kind of change we're talking about. Elite institutions serve as validators and legitimizers. They don't do the invention. There are exceptions like MIT. They don't do the inventions. They let others do the inventions. And they put their stamp on those that work. We're going to see the establishment of a multiplicity of different practices for outcomes, assessments, and accounting. We're going to see debate and discussion at every stage. And finally, we're going to see is something that's come up in almost every session I've been to, standardization. Now, where do we stand today? We have continued embrace of current practice. Rejection need to change by many institutions. Experimentation is ongoing. This room is full of experimenters. New models are being created. Debate and discussion are everywhere. Not only meetings like this. They're in all the trade papers. They're in the popular media. This is everywhere. And we're also witnessing something that's unfortunate. We're witnessing the simultaneous imposition of both models on our schools. What we're asking them to do is take fixed time and fixed process from the industrial model and combine that with fixed outcomes from the information model. You can't do all those things at once. So as we move to an information economy model of credentialing, here's what I think we need to do. We need to go beyond words like competencies and outcomes, which are learning-based units, comparable to industrial era courses and credits. And what we really need to do is achieve common definitions of competencies. What we really have to do is create the equivalent of the DSM in psychiatry, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It offers a common language and standard criteria for classifying mental illnesses. We need that for competencies. When we talk about competencies, we have to be talking about the same thing, or it's just another buzzword. We have to develop assessments that measure student progress and attainment of the standards or the outcomes and help us prescribe to students what it is they need to do in order to achieve those competencies. Now, this is digression. Over time, we really need to build those assessments on analytics and student learning, which are growing so big. We need to embed them in the assessment of curricula to function a lot like a GPS, discovering student misunderstandings in real time and getting them back on track. 
If you look at today's testing, our high stakes testing, it comes too late. The problem with it is it lets us know who has failed to achieve what it is we're testing. Imagine if your GPS worked that way. Okay. <clears throat> you get readings once an hour. When you started, you were 20 miles away from where you're going. An hour later, you're 70 miles away from where you're going. <laughs> you're going in the wrong direction, recalculating. That's not really useful. And neither is testing. It needs to function the same way as our GPS is doing. We need to create common credentials and micro-credentials, badges, to recognize student mastery and competencies and learning outcomes. Degrees are insufficient for this purpose. They're macro-credentials. They're rooted in a package of diverse, disconnected programs and courses. They're rooted in the philosophy of just-in-case learning. We're going to give you these four years just in case you need them. Today, increasingly, we're going to see a demand for just-in-time learning in more specialized areas. And those will be obtained through experience, self-instruction, formal and informal education, offered by a host of providers, universities, non-universities, museum down the block from me is offering a doctorate in astrophysics. I went to visit a publisher and I was looking around the guy's ante room and one of my greatest weaknesses is books. The guy comes out and says, you know, we're not in the book business anymore. And he says, we're in the knowledge business. And I think he saw me roll my eyes. <laughs> and he said, let me give you an example. Subtext. Let me give you an example even you can understand. Okay. <laughs> and he says, we are now in 45,000 schools. Maybe it was 25,000 schools. It's a large number of schools. It was more than 12. And um, he says, he now has my full attention. There's no university in the United States, oh, in teacher education and professional development for teachers. He now has my full attention. There's no university in the United States, no ed provider outside of universities that has that kind of penetration. So I looked at him, I thought I still had the upper hand. And I said, so where are you getting your content from, knowing you had to come president of Teachers College. And he said, we hire full-time content providers. And I thought about that for a minute. I don't have any friends who are full-time content providers. <laughs> my parents didn't have any friends who were full-time content. Even my neighbors aren't full-time content providers. So I asked him, what do you mean? What is a full-time content provider? And he told me, and I realized we just had different names for them. I called them professors, and he called them content providers. I thought I still had them. And I said, what about degrees and credentials? And he said, we're still working on that. They're not anymore. They got degree granting authority. Fact of the matter is, more providers who are gonna offer more education for different lengths of time, 24-7, and it's going to be incumbent upon us to find mechanisms to discover what they've learned as a consequence of all that education. That'll occur throughout their lifetimes, and that's going to necessitate a lifetime transcript to record all of those competencies. And we need an organization. We need an institution to house, curate, secure, and distribute to serve as a lifelong registrar. 
perhaps that begins here in the summit. Now, I don't pretend this is an easy assignment. It's going to take a coalition involving government, federal and state, educational institutions, traditional and non-traditional, professional associations, and other stakeholders to accomplish. A lot of you are in this room today. I don't see why it shouldn't begin here. One closing thought. Shifting education from teaching to learning doesn't mean vocationalizing, diluting, or diminishing it. And that's, and that was true too of the industrial area universities. They did not diminish the quality of agrarian colleges. What they did was, pages are stuck together. I can't wait to find out what they did. <laughs> ah, they revitalized them. And they enriched them. Higher education succeeds best when it has one foot in the library, our heritage, and one foot in the street, the realities of the world in which we live. In times of dramatic change, higher education tends to lose its hold on the street. Today what we're talking about is reestablishing that foot. In doing so, we shouldn't abandon the library. Those functions and activities that should be cherished and preserved. We shouldn't unbundle everything, keep only the most lucrative items, and throw out casually other items that don't ever return. I want to salute you. I want to salute you for being here today. I want to salute you for taking time away from very, very, very busy schedules. I want to salute Parchman for making this day possible. The question we have to ask ourselves as we go forth is actually a question that comes from the Yale Report. They ask this, should colleges change fast or slow? Should they change a lot or a little? the wrong question, as they said. The correct question is, what's the purpose of a college? What's the purpose of an education for other organizations that may be offering it as well? That remains the right question today. In truth, the assignment before us is huge. It's daunting. But there's no generation that's had a greater opportunity to put its stamp on the future of higher education than we have today. That is one extraordinary opportunity and one extraordinary challenge. It's imperative that we succeed because the future depends upon it. Thank you all very much. Somebody must have a question. I'm very grateful to you. I'm going to ask for a favor of people who ask questions. Tell me who you are. Tell me where you're from. And tell me an embarrassing secret you've never told anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want the embarrassing secret first? <laughs> okay, good. You can tell me after. Okay. Um, 
my name is Rena Lichtenfeld. I work with uh, Walden University with Gloria Education. Um, what was the other part? Yeah. It's it's I don't think it's on. It's on. I'm just not speaking clearly enough. I'm Rena Lichtenfeld. I am from Baltimore down the street. I work with Gloria at Higher Education and I um, am here representing Walden University. Um, and actually, um, I think that was a one of the most brilliant things I've ever heard. So thank you for that, first of all. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I, was, I, I wanted to volunteer to type up your notes because I, I vigorously tried to keep up with all of the wonderful things that you said, but I, 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 it's actually a, a true thing. Like, I really would love to type up your notes so I can then relay some of this information that you, you bestowed upon us. So. I only had a comment, I really don't have a question. It was great, thank you. <laughs> An embarrassing thing? I would be grateful if you could use that as a model for this <laughs> Please, all the way in the back. Is there somebody behind that you? That was you. Okay, <laughs> So, uh, my name is, hold on. My name is Susan Jeffers. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at University of Washington, Bothell which is a branch campus of UW. And one of the things I wanted to ask you is, um, it's my sense that as we look at this change in higher education, sort of taking off of your last remarks, that the change is more likely to come from institutions such as mine, such as many of the community colleges here and other organizations, rather than from, let's just say, pick Harvard, for example. Because I think a lot of institutions at that level don't need to change. They're doing just fine the way they are. Um, and so that's my opinion. And I don't know if you would share that, or do you have a sense of where change is most likely to come from as we think about these innovations? That was a really good question. Not as good as the last one, but a pretty good question. <laughs> You're doing better now. Okay, good. I can keep doing that for a while. Where is change going to come from? It's going to come from several places. Um, when you look at what happened in the industrial era, where it really came from, were new universities. It's the kind of thing we've been talking about today. It's the inventors who are here inventing new forms of higher education that are going to have an enormous impact. It's also going to come from institutions that are in trouble. The place I'd look for it is, look for it in small, private, uh, low endowment colleges in New England, the Middle Atlantic States, and the Midwest. Look for it at regional universities, particularly east of the Mississippi. And what I think you'll find in those states is that the population attending regional universities tends to be older, part-time, working. They show up largely for classes. They don't care that there's a new natatorium and gym complex. They don't care about the sports programs that are being offered. They're not looking for extracurricular activities. They don't attend any of them. What these guys told us they wanted was convenience. Offer classes 24-7, unless you can offer them more frequently. <laughs> By the way, in-class parking wouldn't be all bad. Um, what they also want is convenience. They want service and they want high quality instruction and low cost, and they'll shop around. They're looking for a stripped down version of higher education. In short, those are some of the places I expect big change. I expect it in one other place, and it may be the place to watch for the future. California is expecting a tidal wave of 500,000 new students. They can't accommodate them at the University of California, or Cal State, or the community college system. They've got to find or create 
something for those students if they're going to accommodate them. And I predict what they create is universal access, digital, <coughs> low cost, outcome based education for those students. I think some of the most innovative programs in the country are going to come out of that shortfall. So in short, institutions in trouble, institutions with demographic problems, either good or bad, and from outside. Please, your hands went up for a while. Mike Holman from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. A uh, quick comment and then a question. The quick comment is, and I'll say it the way I feel it, I'm tired of hearing us told that we've been rewarding seat time. Nobody ever passed my class by sitting there for 15 weeks. So that's just an aside. Um, my question is, on one hand, we've heard about hybrid. You've just referred to some other sets. Where do you see the flagship of land grants and comparable places fitting into your vision? I think when all of this is over, we keep talking about disruptive change. Even during the industrial era, everything didn't disappear. We still have a lot of the colleges that were created before the, before the 20th century. They just changed. They offered programs that were more relevant. And that doesn't even mean throwing out the liberal arts. It turns out they can offer a very strong education if you offer subjects like German and French and Chinese. It doesn't have to be Latin, Greek, and Syriac. We have very few Syriac speakers in the United States these days. <laughs> We're going to see change in the canon, not a diminishment of the canon. And what we're also going to see, I think, so we'll still have residential colleges for that 20 to 25 percent of 18 to 22 year olds who attend college full time and are residential. We're still going to have research universities because we need research. And the fact of the matter is, I predict when it comes time to start picking off programs, particularly by for-profit companies. And this isn't a bad thing, it's a smart thing. What programs are they going to go after? Are they going to go after physics doctorates? Or MBAs, school leadership degrees, and core courses that all students have to take? They're going to go after high volume, low cost courseware. And they're going to avoid high cost, low volume programs. We can't afford a system it's financially impossible to have a system that relegates only high cost programs that serve social needs for universities. So what we're going to have is, I think we'll see a diminishment in the number of research universities. We'll preserve them, we'll preserve colleges, and I think the rest is up for grabs. Monique Snowden from Fielding Graduate University. Um, thank you, Arthur, for particularly the historical reference there. And as you were talking about that, I was thinking that at that time, one of the major things that was happening in our country in the industrial era was the selling of time. Um, as we saw, basically, um, you know, standardization around time zones were being created, um, communication systems and the need to link those things. And what it made me think about was, at that time, there was something clearly being bought and sold, and it was time. And I wonder what is being bought and sold now, and what is going to be, as we look at this, what will be the center of the changes that we see, and not only what will be the center, but who will be at the center. We know if we reflect back in what you were referencing, there were three main people. It was Frederick Taylor, through Llewellyn Morris in the credit hour, Andrew Carnegie, and um, at Harvard, it was Charles Elliott with the elective system. And I wonder if, if you might have some thoughts about who and what is going to be at our center, if we reflect on this historically? There are limits to how far even major reformers are willing to go. I have a letter on my wall from Charles Eliot. Now, you need to understand, Eliot was president of Harvard from 1869 to 1909. Eliot's the person who introduced all those electives. Eliot remade 
law schools, medical schools, the American high school, and created accreditation. The letter on my walls, Harvard University, I don't remember when in 1900, it says, Dear Mr. Briggs, there's absolutely no chance of our offering instruction in Japanese. Very truly yours, Charles <laughs> Even radicals have limits, and they're tied to their era. In terms of what are we selling and what are we buying, that's an amazing question. And if I had to tell you, I don't know if I'd believe the answer I'm giving you now in an hour. But what I'd tell you is, I think what we're selling is knowledge. We're selling skills, and we're selling learning, not time. Is that doing? I don't know. Good afternoon, um, Karen Solomon from the Higher Learning Commission, formerly known as North Central Association, one of the accrediting agencies. Um, I listened to you uh, back in 1999 at a Y2K conference at Harvard, and you came up with a concept that you briefly mentioned today. So I don't think you use the same notes today, but um, <laughs> you came up with this speech yesterday. <laughs> But you, you, you introduced something that I've talked about over the years and it's been fascinating to me. No one's picked it up. And you brought up today the concept of a lifetime transcript. Back in 1999, you talked about it as a credit bank and, and where people could take the credits that they'd earned and deposit it into a bank and pull from that at different points in time. What's interesting is that over the last 16 years, no one's picked up on that and really brought it to fruition. As a creditor, What's frustrating to me is I see institutions closing, and they're closing on a more rapid basis than they were before. And those transcripts get lost in the shuffle. They're supposed to get handed off to another institution or to a state agency. Uh, maybe they get handed to another institution, and then that institution closes. And so we have people that have earned credentials that can no longer access their credentials. So what, what will it take for us to, as a country, figure out how to begin to save and preserve those credentials that people have earned in the past and going into the future. Do you know something? I don't think I believe in a credit bank anymore. <laughs> um, at least for the future. We do need a credit bank, and I'll talk about how. But in the future, I think credits are going to be gone. I think it'll be competencies that we talk about not the amount of time spent earning them. And in terms of credit banks, in a lot of respect, that's what Parchment's doing. They're taking our transcripts, they're curating them, they're storing them, they're distributing them, they're securing them. And we're going to need organization, organizations that do that. It's going to be essential if we have lifelong Two more hands up. Do I have time? I would say it would be one or two and then bring it right here. My airfare? <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm Joan Kindle and I'm from Eastern Iowa Community Colleges. And um, the question I have is in relationship to concurrent or dual enrollment, in which um, I come from a state in which the, the highest number of students are accumulating college credits while they're still in high school. Uh, which seems to be focused more on the seat time and getting through those credits, uh, and not so much on the competencies, the maturity it takes to integrate learning, or the out-of-class experiences that also um, are important for what I think is integrated learning. So uh, we haven't talked about that today at all, so can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on that? Because the growth of seat time in high schools, I mean, it's accelerating. We have students often who are uh, finishing associate's degrees before they finish high school, um, or are certainly graduating with 15 to 30 credits. And so they're moving on to universities at junior standing before ever graduating from high school. The gap between grade 12 and grade 13 is a historical accident. 
what happened was grades one through eight were created in the 17th century in the United States. And so was higher education. The high school came along just about the middle. I think it's 1839. So the system was already 200 years old. What do you do with this new institution? Well, for a long time, what happened was it competed with colleges. They were both going for students who were the same age, 15, 14, 16. And then after a while, what happened was we created an, an alliance between high schools and one through eight. And that created grades one through 12, K and P got added later. So we have is, because they were built in isolation, what we have in higher education and in grade 12 are different are teachers with different credentials, different reward systems, curricula created separate from one another, different governance structures, different time and time use. And when you create that different funding patterns, when you create two such systems, of course there are problems in articulation between the two. And the reality is if we created third and fourth grade in the same fashion, we would have been asked, how do you close that gap between third and fourth grade? The grades, the progression year by year by year, I think are gonna disappear at least as far as cognitive learning. I don't know what we'll be able to do about social learning and socialization of kids. But what happens is we're talking about a mastery system in which you move along according to what you master. And instead of enriching whatever happened in fourth grade because you already finished the curriculum, you move on to the next order of business in your subject area. Maybe it takes you much more time to master the material in foreign language or English. I know I don't learn any two subjects at the same speed. They're all different degrees of slowness. But um, <laughs> what happens then is we're talking about a system which I expect those grades to disappear. And we'll move students along according to what they know and they can do. And we'll give them appropriate credentials to indicate those things. Dina Stoner, I'm a layman uh, on a university foundation board in a regional university in Pennsylvania, Shippensburg University. You said we needed a coalition, and you said federal, state, then you said others. We're coming up to a higher education reauthorization. If there was a couple core things to move this along, what would you do in higher education reauthorization? Yeah, let me take the question larger than the one you asked. One of the things Woodrow Wilson does is that we have a state teaching fellowship that focuses on whole states. It's in Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, New Jersey, and Georgia. <coughs> One of the things that we do when we go into a state is we form a coalition. And the coalition consists of the governor, the chief state school officer, the state higher education executive officer, legislators on both sides of the aisle, universities, schools, unions, other major stakeholders and philanthropy. And we want that there for these reasons. One, we want continuity. Typically what happens is these kinds of initiatives get formed by, say, the Secretary of Education and three universities. Secretary of Education leaves, three university presidents retire, and after votes of no confidence because they cut the budget, and um, then what happens is that the program falls apart. We wanted that coalition. 
So that if anybody left, even the governor, we've gone from blue to red, we've never had the experience of governor of going from red to blue. And the program continues. It just replaces the person who's lost. And the second thing that happens is you get the business done at the table. And everybody's there and everybody signs off. When we talk about a coalition to get this done, I think the same kinds of principles obtain. Right now in the Senate, we actually have a Democrat and a Republican heading education who talk to each other. I testified um, before their committee. And the committee chair understood because he'd been a college president, a governor, secretary of education, and a senator. All the issues that were out there. And he was a Republican. What I suggest is build those kinds of coalitions. They're powerful. They can move issues. What we're talking about today is going to happen. It's not a question of if it's going to happen. It's a question of when it's going to happen. We have the capacity to accelerate the degree and the timing to which it occurs. We don't have the capacity to stop it. And I think we really ought to take advantage of this. I think that's it. Thank you all very, very much.